So I'm going to try and talk slow, and I've got English subtitles at the bottom. For people for whom English is not your native language, it's important to know that all of these talks, including mine, are being recorded, and you can come back and watch them, I think, for a period of several months. I will also provide my email address at the end and encourage everyone who is interested to email me, and I'm happy to share a copy of this presentation with you. I am not alone, so I want to show here photographs and names of the team I've been fortunate enough to work with over the last six years on these deposits. Everyone you see here, especially all of the students in the middle row, these are all graduate students either at the University of Michigan or the Universidad de Chile in Santiago, where Professor Martin Reich and Professor Fernanda Barra have mentored lots of amazing graduate students doing research. And our graduate students have developed great collaborations among each other. And then on the bottom, I've got a list or a group of photos here of people who have been very instrumental providing us with analytical expertise throughout the last six to seven years that we've worked on this. And I just want to highlight that since 2015, we as a group have published 25 papers on IOCG and IOA systems. My goal today is shown here. So what I want to do is give you a sense of the overall outcome of our research since 2015, where collectively our research demonstrates that magnetite and actinolite chemistry record the temperature of evolution in IOA and IOCG systems, and the temperatures demonstrate that temperatures decrease from the bottom of the systems to the top of the systems. So you can think of them as indicating cooling from bottom to top. If we look at the stable isotope data, iron, hydrogen, and oxygen, and magnetite, stable sulfur isotopes in pyrite, and oxygen and hydrogen isotopes in actinolite, they are all consistent with an ore fluid that is derived from a silicate magma. If we look at the chemical zoning of actinolite, apatite, magnetite, and titanite, and the mineral textures within individual grains, and the textures among actinolite, apatite, magnetite, and titanite, these minerals and their textures record evidence for multiple pulses of hydrothermal fluid in IOA and IOCG systems. And then lastly here, we've also written papers on the trace element chemistry of pyrite. And in particular, I'll show you data for the ratio of cobalt to nickel in pyrite and how that is consistent with a silicate magma source. So with this said, what I'm going to do now is walk you through some of the highlights of our work over the last six years. But before I do that, I just want to remind everyone who's watching today the tremendous importance of economic geology for society. So you're looking here at a slide with seven metals, gold, copper, silver, tin, lead, iron, mercury. And these seven metals are referred to as the metals of antiquity. They are written about in the Torah or the Old Testament of the Hebrew Bible. And these metals and our ability to use them, these are the metals that we used as humans transitioned from the Stone Age to the Copper Age to the Bronze Age, which required copper and tin, to the Iron Age, which required iron, and all the way to today, where we use a phenomenal amount of metals. So if you just look at the solid black line here, if you look from 1960 through today, you can see the tremendous increase in the growth of global consumption of iron ore, where much of this after the year 2000 was construction of new infrastructure in China. We see the same trend with copper from 1960 through today. We use on average every year now 300% more copper than we did in 1960. And for all of us, this is intuitive. We get this and this motivates the science that we do. What we have to do as a community of economic geologists is that we have to network with the general public to make society aware that if we imagine a world where we no longer consume oil or natural gas or coal, 
a so-called hashtag electrify everything, where we have no fossil fuels powering society, that requires a significant growth in our ability to mine metals such as copper, which if you think about copper here in this photograph is really the backbone for our built environment. Everything we do requires copper. I'm talking to you from the basement of my house in Ann Arbor, Michigan. I'm connected through a copper wire to an electrical outlet. And in my house, I actually power from solar panels in my backyard. And if I guess there are people listening from South America, from Africa, from Asia, from Australia, from Europe, all over North America, it's the copper that is this backbone that allows me to send my voice and these images to you. And as economic geologists, we have to work to make sure society develops an appreciation for what we do and the need for what we do. When we look for metals today, they're getting much harder. So this is a plot where we have on the Y axis, the depth from surface. And then on the X axis at the top is the discovery year for different types of mineral deposits, gold, base metals in green, uranium in red, and other in gray. And if we go back to 1900, one of the observations is that most mineral deposits were discovered at the surface, meaning that they had to physically outcrop on the surface in order for geologists to recognize the presence of mineral deposits that outcrop on surface and extend to depth. And if you look at what has occurred over the last 120 years, we certainly continue to find ore deposits at very shallow levels of Earth's crust. But you can see here, as the red envelope indicates, that the proportion of ore deposits that are increasingly being found buried under deeper cover is increasing. And this requires collaboration between economic geologists, between geochemists, and between geophysicists, and importantly, tectonics so that we can understand the general structural model in a global sense for how different types of mineral deposits form so that we can continue to successfully explore for mineral deposits that provide the critical metals to society. Sarah Dare gave a fantastic talk yesterday morning on the overall utility of the, mag of, of the mineral magnetite and Louise Corvu gave a great talk on IOCG, IOA generalities and specifics. So I just want to review in general here, when we think of iron oxide copper gold deposits, this is a schematic cross section for the Manto Verde deposit, which is in the Chilean iron belt in the Atacama region of central Chile, central northern Chile. And all I want to highlight is if you follow my cursor, there's a fault known as the Manto Verde fault, and the evidence is consistent with a hypogene fluid from depth ascending along this fault and then percolating into the hanging wall rocks, the foot wall rocks, and from that fluid, magnetite in black precipitated in the foot wall, hematite in red precipitated in the hanging wall, and chalcopyrite is abundant with both magnetite and hematite. When we look at the modal abundance of minerals in IOCG deposits, magnetite is the modally dominant mineral in all IOCG systems. However, chalcopyrite and the copper that chalcopyrite contains, that is what makes IOCGs economic. We do not mine these for iron or any other metal. These are mined specifically for the copper that they contain. Although iron is always much greater than copper and gold. They are very large deposits from tens to thousands of million tons of ore. As I said, magnetite is modally dominant. Copper makes them economic. Lots of people, including myself, have, have noticed that the concentration of iron and copper are similar to porphyry copper deposits, but there are differences between IOCGs and porphyries. Notably, they are sulfur poor relative to porphyry copper deposits. They are seemingly always coeval with igneous activity. They can be hosted in igneous and sedimentary rocks. 
We think that they are dominantly, if not always, formed in subduction zone and back arc spreading environments. And mineralization is almost always structurally controlled along intrusive contacts in faults or permeable porous horizons that were the conduits for ore fluids. Now, if we look at a schematic for iron oxide apatite deposits, this on the top left is a schematic cross section for the Karuna type iron oxide apatite deposit in northern Sweden. And this deposit is the type locale for Karuna deposits. And all I want you to see is that very similar to IOCGs, I'm tracing here a fault and within that fault is the ore body. Now, this is the ore body that has been mined out since the year 1900. And then we have the surrounding host rock that's been mined out for safety issues, engineering issues. Iron oxide apatite deposits are dominated by magnetite. It is common that magnetite is 60 to 90% modal volume percent of iron oxide apatite deposits. They're also very large. The iron contents are similar to porphyry copper and iron is what makes iron oxide apatites economic. They are sulfur poor relative to porphyry copper deposits and they're sulfur poor relative to IOCG deposits. Magnetite historically prior to 2015 is reported to be titanium poor. These deposits have become interesting because apatite can be enriched in rare earth elements. And all of these four bottom bullet points that you've probably read by now are identical to what I just stated for the iron oxide apatite deposit, iron oxide copper gold deposits. IOA deposits have coeval igneous activity. They're dominantly hosted in igneous rocks. They form in a subduction zone environment and mineralization is structurally controlled. We find iron oxide apatite and iron oxide copper gold deposits all over the world. So without going into detail, if you simply look at the six continents where we mine, we do not mine in Antarctica, but we find them throughout North America, South America, Africa, Europe, Scandinavia, Asia, Southeast Asia, India, Australia. So they are prolific around the world. And this is a map of age on the y-axis versus the reported resource on the x-axis. And all I want to highlight here is they have formed throughout geologic time. This is something that distinguishes them from porphyry deposits. Porphyry deposits are most common in the Phanerozoic, and there are a limited number of porphyries that have been discovered in the Proterozoic. That is not the case for iron oxide, copper, gold, and iron oxide apatite deposits, where both deposit types formed in geologic environments prior to the great oxidation event and after the great oxidation event. So if we compare them side to side, these are the same lists that I've already explained to you. All I want to make, all I want to highlight here is that there are lots of similarities between iron oxide, copper, gold and iron oxide apatite deposits. The fundamental difference between the two is that Chalcopyrite is abundant in IOCGs, but both types of deposits are modally dominated by magnetite. Both types of deposits contain significant actinolite and both deposits contain relatively minor, but still ubiquitous appetite. Our group was motivated to study these deposits starting in 2013 based on the map shown on the right, which is the Chilean iron belt here in the country Chile in South America, where there are 50 or more IOA and IOCG deposits hosted in the 1000 kilometer long trench parallel Atacama fault system. So when we look here at the black lines, all of the red dots are IOA deposits. All of the green dots are iron oxide, copper, gold deposits. And when we look at each of these in detail, what we can see is that they are temporally related, meaning they have all formed within the same window of geologic time, and they are often spatially related. And in some systems where drill core penetrates completely to the bottom of an IOCG system and into the underlying rock, the sulfide poor rock,
there is a clear transition from iron oxide, copper, gold mineralization at shallow levels of the crust to iron oxide appetite mineralization at deeper levels of the system. So this is a slide that Martin Reich put together for a Goldschmidt conference a few years ago, and I'll borrow it here to tell you that where we started was to look at magnetite. When we did a literature review of magnetite studies in IOA and IOCG deposits in 2013 and 2014, there is a dearth of studies prior to that date. So even though magnetite is the modally dominant mineral in both IOA and IOCG systems, there had been very, 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 very few studies of magnetite itself. So we thought that the best way to understand the evolution of these systems was to focus on the mineral magnetite, since it is the main constituent of both deposit types. Sarah Dare gave a great review yesterday of magnetite chemistry, so I'll just highlight this here. Magnetite has an inverse spinel structure, and the chemical formula is one mole of iron two plus, two moles of iron three plus for each four moles of oxygen. And the, hot, the key here is that when we look at magnetite, it has both octahedral sites that contain ferrous iron and ferric iron, and it has tetrahedral sites that contain only ferrous iron. Now that's important because as Sarah reviewed yesterday, and I'll show you here in a, a diagram from a paper that Patrick Nadol published in 2014, if we look at on the y-axis for both of these plots charge versus ionic radius on the x-axis, you can see these circles that predict based on the charge and radius of other elements, what elements will substitute for ferric iron in the tetrahedral site in magnetite and what elements will substitute for ferrous and ferric iron in the octahedral site. And you can see that there are a large number of minor and trace elements that can substitute into magnetite. And one of the things that we learned from Patrick Nadol's study is that the concentration of trace elements in magnetite is temperature dependent. At high temperatures, the structure of magnetite, it vibrates more, it gets bigger, and so it can accommodate a larger, a larger amount of atoms other than iron. And as temperature decreases, magnetite structure becomes more rigid and it accommodates a smaller amount of other atoms besides iron. So we first started studying iron oxide appetite deposits at the Los Colorados iron oxide de deposit, which is in the Chilean iron belt. And if you look at these images and follow my cursor, the top left is a backscattered electron image taken on a scanning electron microscope. And simply looking at the BSE image, you can see that the central part of this magnetite grain has lots of inclusions, whereas the mantle over that central part of the magnetite grain is almost inclusion free. There's very little difference in the concentration of iron throughout the magnetite grain. And if you look at magnesium and silica, you can see here where we've highlighted inclusions within the central part or the core of magnetite that are enriched in elements such as magnesium, silicon, and aluminum. What, noted, what was very notable about our first studies was that when we look at titanium, this inner part of magnetite which we refer to as zone one, is titanium rich relative to this mantle, which we refer to as zone two. And there's a relatively abrupt transition here, but you can also see that there has been what we interpret dissolution recrystallization of magnetite, where the most plausible explanation for these observations is that magnetite in zone one represents a generation one magnetite and mantled by zone two, which represents a second generation of magnetite. And the second generation of magnetite grew in the presence of a hydrothermal fluid, such that we now have these beautifully euhedral grown, euhedral uh, crystals 
and also small rims or mantles that we refer to as zones three and four. And we can see that that hydrothermal fluid most certainly dissolved and then from that fluid reprecipitated magnetite as it penetrates into the core and you see the titanium concentration decreases. When we look at this in specific ore deposits, so here we're looking at data from the El Laco iron oxide copper gold deposit in northern Chile. On the left hand side, follow my cursor, we're looking at samples from the surface to a depth of slightly more than 200 meters. And all I want you to see here is that what we commonly think of as magnetite when we hold it in our hand, there are multiple generations of magnetite in these samples from El Laco as a function of depth and the textures and the composition, the composition changes because that is reflected in the change in grayscale for the backscattered electron images. The composition changes and what we highlight here is that the concentration of titanium, <coughs> excuse me, systematically increases from the surface to depth. And we see that in the plot on the right where we've plotted on the y-axis aluminum plus manganese versus titanium plus vanadium and ignore all of the fields here. I simply want you to look at the color data that I'm tracing over here. The deepest samples from El Laco have, higher have the highest concentrations of aluminum plus manganese and titanium plus vanadium. And the concentrations of these elements systematically decrease from depth to surface. We have now seen this in IOA and IOCG deposits everywhere that we've looked. Missouri, Sweden, Iran, Chile, Peru, Australia. Every iron oxide apatite and iron oxide copper gold deposit that we've looked at. When we sample magnetite in drill core, the deepest samples are enriched in trace elements and the shallowest samples are depleted in trace elements. And that is consistent with a cooling trend from hot magnetite at depth to progressively cooler magnetite in the shallower levels of these deposits. We've also made some really interesting observations within magnetite of the inclusions. So I showed you or I pointed out in a few, a few slides ago that we can see these inclusions in magnetite cores that indicate high concentrations of magnesium, silica, and aluminum using EDX mapping on an SEM. We have done work to carefully understand what the inclusions are in the core. And we have found inclusions in the cores of magnetite at Los Colorados that are consistent with silicate melt inclusions. And these silicate melt inclusions homogenize at temperatures above 875 degrees, which can only be explained by the magnetite core having crystallized from a silicate melt at magmatic temperatures. We've done laser ablation work on these magnetite grains. So on the bottom here is a reflected light image. And this trough that I'm showing here this is a trough where we used a laser to ablate magnetite from the rim through that outer mantle or zone two through the core. And what we can see in the laser ablation signal, we can see peaks for elements such as titanium and peaks for elements such as manganese and sodium. And if I highlight the peaks right here where we have low titanium, we see this increase in the signal for elements such as sodium and potassium, elements that are fluid mobile and very careful polishing without water and imaging and, and analysis on our SEM revealed that in this zone two mantle, there are fluid inclusions, which I'm tracing over here top left. And these fluid inclusions, you can see on the bottom left area of the fluid inclusion, that is a crystal of halite. And that's indicated by the top right panel. You see the increase in counts for sodium and the bottom left panel. You see an increase in the counts for chlorine. So at Los Colorados, what we observed is cores of magnetite that contain silicate melt inclusion and mantles 
that contain hypersaline fluid inclusions. And the fact that this fluid inclusion contains a halite crystal, that requires that the magnetite in this mantle or zone two precipitated from a fluid that contained at least 32 weight percent NAC or 35 weight percent NACL equivalent. And that's based on experimental work by Bob Bodner and his students at Virginia Tech. We've also now looked at stable isotopes of iron and oxygen. And I'll just highlight that if we have on the Y axis, this is the ratio of iron 56 to iron 54. And the X axis is our, nor is our traditional delta 18 O oxygen. If we look at this box here in orange, every magnetite grain from an igneous rock everywhere on planet Earth will have delta 56 iron values and delta 18 O values that plot within this orange box. If we blow that up, we can see that all of the iron and oxygen stable isotope data for iron oxide appetite and iron oxide copper gold deposits in Missouri, in Chile, in Peru, in Sweden, in Iran, in Australia, in Africa, they all yield values that are consistent with iron and oxygen having been derived from a silicate magma. And this is consistent with mineralization caused by a magmatic hydrothermal ore fluid. We publish data also for in situ iron isotope analyses. And what, what those data reveal is that the cores of magnetite are enriched in delta 56 iron relative to the rims. And in this paper, if you read this paper, we model how that could have occurred. And it's consistent with precipitation of magnetite from a silicate melt that formed the core and a mantle that formed the zone two or the rim. We've also measured hydrogen and oxygen isotopes of magnetite. And it's important here for you to remember that magnetite structurally contains oxygen, Fe3O4. It does not structurally contain hydrogen. The hydrogen here is contained within hydrothermal aqueous fluid inclusions that are trapped in magnetite as magnetite grows from a hydrothermal fluid. These are data for El Laco that we published in a paper last year in economic geology. And if we look at delta D or hydrogen two over hydrogen one on the Y axis and percent water on the X axis, what you can see at El Laco is the most unaltered samples are consistent with precipitation from a magmatic hydrothermal fluid and shallow level alteration or chemical weathering by meteoric fluids, which converts magnetite to gertite. As the proportion of gertite increases in the magnetite samples, the hydrogen isotopes decrease and the percent water increases. So this is perfectly consistent with alteration post mineralization. And we see the same thing here on the right hand side, where if we look at hydrogen isotopes and oxygen isotopes, this purple box represents the values for magnetite in equilibrium with magma or magmatic hydrothermal fluid. And this trend is consistent with the growth of magnetite from silicate melt as the melt degasses. We've also recently started measuring oxygen 17, which is the least abundant stable isotope of oxygen. And all I want to highlight here is these are data that Maria Alejandra Rodriguez Mustafa published this year in economic geology for the Mina Justa IOCG deposit in Chile and in Peru, excuse me. And we compare these to iron oxide appetite deposits in Iran, El Laco and Candelaria, where iron 56 and, and oxygen 18 ratios, all of these data minus one outlier plot within the magmatic or magmatic hydrothermal range that is expected. This outlier here is most plausibly consistent with the mixing of a primary magmatic hydrothermal ore fluid with an external fluid that had equilibrated with carbonate. If we look at the cap delta 17 oxygen ratios on the y axis on the plot on the right versus traditional delta 18O, all I want to highlight is 
values expected for igneous and magmatic hydrothermal magnetite are in this box that I'm tracing. And the shift in cap delta 17 is consistent with a small proportion of magnetite in equilibrium with fluids that exchanged oxygen with evaporites. So fluid mixing in the latter stages of mineralization in these systems. We have looked at the sulfur isotope composition of pyrite. This is a paper that Irene Del Real, who is a postdoc at the Universidad de Chile in, in uh, Santiago published. And all I wanna highlight here is that for sulfides in the Candelaria IOCG deposits, based on the histogram, all of the sulfur isotope values are consistent with the derivation of sulfur from a magmatic source reservoir. And the excursion of these D34 sulfur isotope values to positive and slightly negative values, that can be modeled by measuring the selenium and plotting selenium over sulfur. And this is a box here top left for the predicted selenium sulfur ratios for pyrite that crystallizes from a magmatic derived magmatic hydrothermal fluid. And then you can see already here has a dashed line that indicates a mixing trend where samples that plot outside of that magmatic box are mixing with different proportions of basinal seawater derived fluids. And again, that's also consistent with the oxygen isotope values here and the hydrogen isotope values here. We've looked at cobalt nickel ratios of pyrite. And all I wanna highlight here is that when we look at cobalt versus nickel for deposits in the Chilean iron belt, deposits, for example, Ernest Henry and IOCGs, uh, Ernest Henry in Australia, the elevated, if we look at the right, the elevated cobalt nickel, nickel ratios are consistent also with the mineral, 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 mineralizing fluid having been derived from a silicate magma. So recently, Gisela Palma, who's now a faculty member in Chile and former PhD student and postdoc at the Universidad de Chile, Gisela wrote a phenomenal review paper where she looked at magnetite crystals and she measured the magnesium concentrations of magnetite and used a magnesium in magnetite thermometer to calculate the temperatures of magnetite crystallization. And all I want to highlight here is that she compiled the data for all of these different ore deposits in the Chilean iron belt as a function of the ore deposits that formed at shallow depth and increasing depth within the upper crust. And while there is variability among the calculated temperatures, there is a systematic trend in the deeper levels or the, for, or the systems that formed at deeper levels of the crust that temperatures increase. And you can see that here, if we look at the right side of each of these data sets for each deposit, we can see here that Los Colorados, magnetite from the massive ore body, some of these magnetite grains, the magnetite crystallized at temperatures approaching 1000 degrees. These magnetite grains, as I stated earlier, contain silicate melt inclusions. So these magnetite grains that contain silicate melt inclusions yield very high magmatic temperatures, whereas the magnetite at lower temperatures that contains hydrothermal fluids, those brines that I showed you, they yield temperatures within this magmatic hydrothermal and hydrothermal range. So I'm now gonna show you some detailed analyses or data from the Candelaria IOCG deposit in Chile. And on the left-hand side is a schematic from Lundin where you can see here, I'll trace out with my cursor, the ore body. And on the right-hand side, you can see from surface in red is the main mineralized area. So this is the area or the volume of Candelaria that contains Calc that contains enough calcopyrite to make it economic to mine. Irene Del Real has written several fantastic papers as well as Maria Alejandra Rodriguez Mustafa, where this drill core LD1687, it penetrates through the main mineralized area 
through this area in black stipple that is magnetite actinolite rich and into the subjacent country rocks. And what Irene worked on is that she, well, what Irene observed is that in shallow samples, so this is a depth 203 meters below the, the drill core collar, we have pervasive magnetite actinolite sulfide free alteration assemblages at depth that transition to calcopyrite magnetite biotite case bar mineralization in the shallow levels of the system. So in this one drill core, we can see a transition from bottom at 1100 meters depth, magnetite actinolite rich mineralization with minor appetite, almost no sulfides. And from 1100 meters towards surface, we see a proportional increase in the abundance of chalcopyrite. This is what is being mined. This at depth represents a possible iron resource. And the mineralogy at depth is consistent with the mineralogy of iron oxide appetite deposits. The mineralogy in the shallow level, it is iron oxide copper gold mineralization. Irene focused on actinolite. So here I'm showing two backscattered electron images of actinolite, and you can see there are different depths here in that system. If you look with me at the right image and you follow my cursor, if you look at this grain of actinolite where the scale bar is 190 microns, I want you to see here that there's a change in the grayscale from the core to a rim back to a darker gray and then on the perimeter, a lighter white. Irene did high resolution wavelength dispersive elemental analyses on an electron microprobe. And we can see an almost similar grain on the right side here, where that core, if we calculate the temperature at which actinolite crystallized, and you can do this by using the concentrations of magnesium and iron in actinolite, the ratio of magnesium to iron, there is an experimentally determined geothermometer for actinolite. The actinolite cores in this sample yield temperatures, if we look at the scale on the right, above 700 degrees. Those cores are overgrown by a mantle or a rim that yields lower temperatures, but temperatures still above 600 degrees. And then you can see that the actinolite yields temperatures that are hotter again, and then it yields temperatures that get colder. So Irene refers to this as hot, cold, hot fluctuations. And the only plausible explanation for this is that primary actinolite here crystallized from a high temperature magmatic hydrothermal fluid. And as that fluid cooled, actinolite precipitated here from a cooler fluid. And then a second fluid percolated through this system and that fluid was responsible for the return to high temperature actinolite growth that we see here as the mantle on this grain. And on the left, you can see another example of actinolite from this system. This is something that is systematic in the actinolite samples from Candelaria. And this is a plot from Irene's recent paper, which is available open access on nature communications, earth and environment. And you can see here that at the top, we have temperature, cold to hot, and then we have surface or drill collar surface down to 1110 meters. And you can see that there's variability in the temperature of actinolite at a given depth, but the stars clearly, which are the average, clearly demonstrate that the system is hot at the bottom and systematically cools off towards the surface. And if we look at the grades of iron, copper, and gold shown in these histograms on the right as a function of depth, we can see that the deeper part of the system for which magnetite and actinolite indicate temperatures above 700 degrees, there is abundant iron, but almost no copper and essentially no gold. And then at depths here, shallower than about 600 meters,
we start to see a significant increase in the percent copper, which is contained within, cal <coughs> excuse me, calcopyrite, and the percent or the, the grams per ton gold. And this is consistent with the mineralogy changing from iron and actinolite or magnetite and actinolite dominated at depth to magnetite, actinolite, calcopyrite in the shallow and upper portions of the system. Irene modeled this, and I'll just want you to focus here on the bottom plot, where she looked at individual pixels from the microprobe data <clears throat> of actinolite, that so-called hot, cold, hot. And when you look at the data as a function on the x-axis of temperature, where we have a histogram of the pixels extracted from the temperature maps versus calculated temperature, the data are consistent with two episodes of growth, right? One episode of growth that is this hot core and slightly cooler mantle, and a second growth that is consistent with this outer hot mantle, and then we can see cooler growth on the outside of that hot mantle. And the data are consistent with the model shown here in red and green that predicts at least two pulses of fluid in the system. The first pulse of fluid was responsible for the main stage magnetite, actinolite, apatite at depth. And the second, and possibly in the shallow levels of the system, the second pulse of fluid, which overprinted superimposing calcopyrite on the earlier generation of magnetite and actinolite. So these data predict two or more ages of hydrothermal minerals. We see that in the BSE images. We see that in the X-ray chemical maps for actinolite. We see that in the magnetite thermometers. And so the story that evolves is one that predicts two pulses of fluid. Now, one of the most recent things that we've done, and we've just submitted this to the, the journal Geology for review, is we have started to look in detail at magnetite shown here in the lighter gray, titanite, and apatite. And petrographically, we can demonstrate that apatite, titanite, and magnetite are coeval in some samples, but not in all. And we've used in situ laser ablation, multi-collector, inductively coupled plasma mass spectrometry to analyze apatite, titanite, and magnetite for uranium lead isotope abundances. And the results here are shown with age on the y-axis and depth on the x-axis. So this is that drill core I showed you that penetrates through candelaria. The yellow here is the age of mineralization. And that yellow bar is determined by rhenium osmium molybdenite dates that were reported by Ryan Mather and colleagues for the Candelaria system. The gray bar at the top, that is the age range for the host andesites at Candelaria. We can see that if we look at the colors here, the blue and the green circles I hope your eyes are better than mine. The, the, the blue triangles represent titanite uranium lead ages, and the blue boxes or squares represent titanite uranium lead ages measured at two different labs. All of the appetite data are in green. And what we can see is that the titanite data and the appetite data from shallow levels of the system, 133 meters depth, to deep levels of the system, they are consistent with main stage copper iron sulfide mineralization. And they are petrographically consistent with coeval precipitation from an ore fluid. We also see in the titanite data and the magnetite data, these data here at shallow levels of the system, and we can see at deeper levels of the system, those data record earlier pulses of magmatic hydrothermal fluid. Now, the reason that the uncertainty on the magnetite ages is greater than the uncertainty on apatite and titanite is that magnetite was analyzed using a 60 micron laser spot size. We know that petrographically, based on work that Maria Alejandra has done, we know that petrographically these magnetites 
have cores and mantles or cores and rims. So we know that we're averaging the age of two or more different generations of magnetite. So these data we interpret for magnetite to indicate magnetite growth simultaneous with the copper iron sulfide mineralization event and these apatite and titanite grains and older magnetite that is consistent with the growth of these older titanite ages. And I'll highlight here, this is one robust argon-argon actinolite age at 121.2, I think, which is also consistent with this titanite age, which is also consistent with this magnetite age. So the ages or the dates that are yielded from uranium lead geochronology of magnetite, titanite, and apatite, and rhenium osmium libdenite and argon argon actinolite are entirely consistent with a model for multiple fluid pulses in the Candelaria system. So there's a lot of text here, and I don't have a clock, so I don't know what time it is, but I'm going to uh, let you uh, read this text later. What time is it, if Anne or Sarah can tell me? It's more or less so time is, is done. Okay, so I'm pretty much done here. And I just want to present a schematic model that, again, we published in this paper at the bottom where Rene Del Real is the first author. What we're now trying to understand is how nature perform, how nature produces these deposits, which share metal abundances with porphyry systems, but do not contain stockwork veining. There is not an abundance of quartz veining in these systems. And we have ideated a model where from left to right, a magma chamber is the source of the mineralizing fluids in plural. And as a function of time, that magma chamber and the volatiles that it exalves, the mineralizing fluid, they are tapped by regional motion on faults that are part of the basement penetrating Atacama fault system. So the Atacama fault system it is the path for mantle derived magmas that ascend to shallow levels of the crust. The scale bar here on the left is four kilometers. So these magmas, they are moving up along fault conduits. And when those magmas degas, both by crystallization induced degassing and decompression induced gassing, the fluids are tapped. And what we suggest is that the earlier magnetite actinolite rich fluids those are the first fluids that evolve from the source magmas and super and and those are the fluids that precipitate magnetite and actinolite and fluorine rich apatite which i forgot to mention and then super superimposed on that mineralization we have younger fluids that introduce copper and precipitate the copper iron sulfides that make iocgs economic We've tested this experimentally, and I'll just put this up here if anybody's interested in, in reading this paper where we have done experiments to test this model and the experiments demonstrate that it, it works. So my last two or three slides here, and then I'll be done, Anne, I promise, Anne or Lee. When everybody talks about carbon neutrality, this is back to my first few comments about the importance of economic geologists effectively communicating with, so with society with the people who don't do our work, that if we want to achieve carbon neutrality, that means electrify everything. There is a significant amount of copper that has to be produced. So this is an estimate for different scenarios here on the right for the amount of copper that will be required over the next two to three decades so today we consume globally about 20 million tons of copper. That will double and possibly triple over the next few decades. And this is my last slide. If you want me to talk with this about you on Zoom, or if you'd like for me to give a talk at your university, please email me. And I'm also happy if you email me. All of our papers are in this Google Drive. So I hope Larry Minard is not listening. Um, but all of these are available and I'm happy for you to download them and use them. And I'm happy also to send you this link. So thank you very much. Fantastic. Fantastic. Thank you so much, thank you so much Adam.